I'm delighted that our first speaker in the Evolutionary Origins of Speech Act conference is uh, Friedrich Stiegenberg from Linköping University. Um, I'm uh, very glad that uh, Professor Stiegenberg has agreed to join us. Uh, thank you for being here and please take it away. Okay, thanks for having me and thanks for putting up with me. I guess you'll find after an hour or so. Um, I, I will be talking about um, a certain kind of um, human uniqueness claim. And this is uh, a losing proposition in one way because claims about human uniqueness, they haven't fared particularly well over the ages. I think uh, Franz de Waal uh, sums it up pretty nicely here that they typically cycle through four stages. Um, Repeat, keep repeating them, then they're challenged by new findings, uh, hobble towards retirement, and then they're dumped in an ignominious grave. Um, so w one day in the brief future, I hope, um, my suggestion of the uniqueness of human asking um, will also be dumped in an ignominious grave. But um, so far, this kind of... Um, uniqueness claim has stood up remarkably well. And it's also a bit interesting because many of the things related to uh, humans asking questions have sort of managed to fly under the radar in most settings. And, and that's um, what prompted me to put together this talk then. Um, now, Questions have a, a particularly central role in human lives compared with um, other, uh, with the non-human animals. Um, questions, as as anyone who has spent time with a four-year-old uh, knows very well, questions suffuse our lives. Um, and um, one one thing, since this is about the evolution of speech acts, and I will be talking about the evolution of the speech act of asking questions. Um, it turns out they're not they're not super difficult to model. It's roughly on the same level of difficulty as giving commands. Um, and we do find lots and lots of commands and requests among chips. Um, that has been extensively studied. I say a bit about that. Um, but uh, one almost gets the impression that that's the only thing chimpanzees are doing when communicating with each other. They're, they're telling each other to do certain things. So we find lots and lots of commands. Um, and a, a very natural observation is that it would be very good for chimps to be able to ask each other stuff. Uh, re requests for information from conspecifics would be a, a brilliant thing to have. Or a chimpanzee, but it, it just seems that we, we don't really find that in chimps. Um, but it's so central for human beings. Uh, we, we find very little that would look like a question among chimps. Um, I've spoken to primatologists about this, and they're, they're also a bit puzzled. Um, I might be, well, you can assess my evidence later on because I will be presenting a few things that start to look like questions in chimps, but there's very, very little of the kind. And compare that with, uh, my guess is that you, each and every one, um, already today, it's early in the morning, but I, my guess is that each and every one of you has posed a question or several questions already. Uh, we've heard uh, Andre asking everyone if they were okay with recording, and I'm pretty sure that everyone else in this uh, setting actually has asked a few questions already today. Um, so we have one, one thing I'd like to call a mystery. Why don't we find questions among other primates? And then something um, I'd like to call a catch-22, which is that, okay, um, you have to know a language to ask questions, but in Look back at what happens when you do learn a language. You have to ask questions to learn the language. Um, of course, this is not a pure catch-22 because we can find ways perhaps around it, but um, it's still a bit puzzling. It will turn out that 
evolution seems to have solved this particular catch in the case of human beings, but uh, perhaps not for other species. Okay, is it a... Um, I, I'm cherry picking a few examples now to to sort of bolster my claim that it is a kind of uh, activity that has been sailing below the radar for quite some time. <clears throat> One thing is that the, the classical list of human universals uh, does not mention asking question. It mentions lots of other specifically human uh, speech acts or for instance, greeting people, that, that's one kind of speech act, and that is mentioned among the human universals. But asking questions is not mentioned, which sort of indicates that it was probably a bit too um, obvious or under the radar to, to be noticed even by the very diligent people uh, composing these lists of human universals. Another still cherry picking example is that if you look at work in um, formal semantics. Um, there's lots of work on commands, lots of work on conditionals, but very little work on uh, the nature of questions. Same goes for linguistics. Um, there is work, um, but um, it, it's not like I could fill an entire bookshelf with it. There are a few titles. And one even more cherry-picked example, which I kind of find um, interesting and I, I think some of you speaking later today will actually come from a Brandomian setting in a way. And um, Brandom's inferentialism is, uh, he keeps stressing that this inferentialism is about how we give and how we ask for and give reasons. But then he writes, what is it now? Six big books or something like that. Um, Everything in the books is about giving reasons. Nothing is about asking for reasons. But he still uh, hangs on to his catchphrase. It's about giving and asking for reasons. But there's very little explicit work on what it means to ask for a reason. When is it OK for, to ask for a reason? When is it OK not to ask for a reason? And so on. Nothing is said about that. Lots is said about giving reasons. Um, I asked Bradham about that and he, well, it was a private communication and it was in mail, but I, I kind of sensed that he was a bit uh, almost shamefaced about it. Well, it was a bit like, oh, I hadn't thought about that. And, and that just indicates um, that it tends to fly under our radar. So why should we then um, be interested in looking at questions? Um, well, as I stressed, it's um, a universal activity. Everywhere we've looked, people ask questions. Um, it's also an almost exclusively human activity. I, I, could, oh, I could nearly strike the almost, but um, perhaps not quite. Um, it's also, I'd like to say that it's an unlearned, activity. Uh, I've been told by ethologists that I um, labor with a very unsophisticated notion of what it means to be learned and unlearned. Um, I'll stick with my unsophisticated notion then and um, keep saying that in, in, a certain, in a certain sense to be explored further, it actually is unlearned. What is also particularly interesting for um, us is that even if questions in the sense of looking for information from someone in the know um, seems to require language, there are some in human infants, pre-verbal infants, there are some very clear precursors to full question asking. And this is something um, that comes very early, seems to come very naturally, and is also pervasive. And, and the, the whole custom or uh, activity or language game, if you want to, uh, of asking questions is pervasive in two senses. We ask questions all the time, not just four-year-olds. I mean, there are several different assessment of how many questions a four-year-old asks and 
a, a day and it kind of they, most assessments run into the hundreds actually um but not just four-year-olds ask questions all the time lots of grown-ups do it as i kind of try to make to you um earlier you probably have asked a bunch of questions already today another thing another way in which uh, questions are pervasive is that for us human beings, um, our, our surroundings are so complex that the, it would be a completely hopeless project to get a grip on what's going on in our surroundings if we couldn't ask questions. Um, if you compare this with um, much simpler biological organisms that or take a bird that only eats red berries of a certain kind. They don't have to ask too many questions about their surroundings, simply because uh, you, you can hardwire most of the interesting stuff. Is there a red berry around while well, eat it? Is there none? Um, keep moving. Another thing that is special about humans uh, looking for information is that um, it's a strong sense for explanations. And um, these explanations, already in very, very small children, are um, of a causal nature. They're looking for the reason behind the cause for something. And it has turned out, pr primatologists have studied versions of, of this problem for, for quite some time. And, and the, the general, I think, consensus is that chimps for instance, are pretty bad at understanding course of relationships. They um, they can be trained to grasp certain causal relationships, but it doesn't come naturally, and it doesn't seem to be something they uh, go for um, without training. Okay, I said that it um, could we could model this in speech act theory. And um, if, if we look at um, the classic uh, statement in the Searle van der Fierken, um, you, you have the several, you, you have the seven points of what makes up or what in, in what dimensions we should try to analyze speech acts. And we can, pretty nicely put uh, these different things into an analysis of um, what is it to ask a question. So the, uh, the, the activity of asking questions is um, amenable to speech act analysis. I won't go through the details. Um, I think you can make out most of the points or, or the kind of issues we have Here. And here we have what I think is a bit, at least a bit puzzling, is that if we look at commands, we can we can use one to seven to account for commands and for questions. And as Searle in his own book, Speech Acts, he uses promise as a starting example. And it's it's not super difficult to transpose his analysis of promising um, into an, an a la analysis of commanding. That's, um, it's a straightforward kind of exercise you could you could set for students and, and they would get a reasonably good um, re result if they put their minds to it. And here we have a kind of mystery that we find lots of commands and requests among other primates. Um, so what, when saying that we find lots of commands and requests among other primates, am I then saying that we find some kind of proto-speech acts in other primates? Well, I, I think that's pretty correct, even if um, we can't do the sophisticated kind of Searle van der Fierken um, analysis. And um, Searle himself tended to stress the uh, need for certain kinds of institutions for a uh, um, a speech act to work, and we don't really have that in other primates. So in that sense, it doesn't work. But uh, I, I can always, 
it could it could still be useful to talk of these things as proto speech acts. Um, and where would we find them? Um, these proto speech acts. Well, in primate gestures. Um, and this has been studied extensively. Now, <clears throat> I will give a few examples uh, in in a couple of minutes. But one thing is that. Um, Many of these theories about what it is to communicate, how communication should be understood and so on, they are sort of working under the Gricean paradigm, which is, um, has been argued by many, um, a bit over intellectualizing. And it's really clear that if we want to apply this general notion of um, using some kind of speech act, we shouldn't walk along this uh, highly intellectualizing way, because this says that meaning something by an utterance or a gesture for that matter, if and only if uh, it is done with an intention to produce a response and intending the hearer to recognize that the sender intends something. And, and this gets us off on tricky uh, nested intentions and um, intentions about someone else's intentions and so on, and works at times nicely for human communication, but doesn't really cut it for understanding um, animal gesture. So we should be be careful about importing the whole Gricean, Serlian uh, machinery into understanding um, chimp gesturing. Um, just a kind of word of warning here. Okay, when people look at chimp gesturing, they have found 66 gestures to intentionally communicate 19 different meanings. Um, I'll take their word for it. Um, this is a difficult kind of empirical study um, involving lots and lots of watching videos and, and studying them closely. I'll just assume that this is more or less correct. Perhaps it's not 66, perhaps it's 65 or 68, who knows, but um, everyone is in agreement that they use um, a sizable number of different gestures to intentionally communicate something like 20-ish uh, meanings. So there is some variation, but it's also pretty fixed that they have this. Um, shall we call it vocabulary then? Okay, what do we find? We find commands and we find gestures. No, commands and requests. Um, the typical is the alpha chimp telling someone move over um, or give me or, or groom me and so on. And um, they're often in um, combination, visual and tactile. And there's a somewhat messy slide coming up, which will be a di bit difficult to see. It's useful if you have a PDF paper just below your nose, um, but this is a pretty full um, uh, treatment of all the different stuff we find in observed chimps. Um, and they're all related to goals. You can see that in the right uh, column there. Goal, acquire object, initiate grooming, um, climb on me, initiate copulation, mount me, follow me, travel with me, move away, stop doing that, and so on. And uh, it's somewhat stylized. I will, um, I will send the slides to Andre, so you won't have to. Um, sort of try squinting so your eyes bleed here. Um, all these, shall we call it them proto-speech act, they are, they are accompanied by special gestures and meaning stays constant across signalers. We have, as far as I understand, there's very little, uh, almost none uh, of a cultural variation which perhaps would indicate that it's more or less hardwired um, that this or that um, stands for um, this or that goal. Who knows about the, the specific details here, but um, meaning 
the, the connection meaning gesture is pretty fixed in the chimps there. Uh, and again, <clears throat> we, we see examples here, left column, um, a kind of, shall we call it translation of what's going on? Travel with me, climb on you, travel with me, if an infant says it. And they, they scratch, they embrace, they reach for, um, and there are goals. All this has been studied, and, and the literature is quite fascinating um, to look at. Here are some more examples with some um, examples. Um, chimps can apparently want to be flirted with. Flirt with me. Tearing strips from leaves with the teeth means flirt with me, apparently. Um, one thing we would want to know here is how flexible is this? I said that it seems to be more or less hardwired that there is this um, gesture of meaning coordination, but how flexible are they? Well, even the classic cause of the vervet monkey, um, the, the ones going one kind of warning shriek for eagles leading to one kind of behavior in, in those hearing it, um, when the other warning shriek for leopard comes, they do something else. They climb up in a tree. If the if it's an eagle, they they hide under a bush. If it's a leopard, they climb up into a tree. If it's a snake uh, shriek, uh, they um, look closely at the ground and tend to uh, run up into a tree and so on. Even these classic calls show at least some flexibility in sending a receiver. Um, a vervet monkey that sees an eagle won't send a message if uh, it thinks that the others won't hear it. Um, they are too far away, for instance. And the receivers won't heed the warning call if the sender is unreliable. Um, so there is some flexibility, and we have every reason to, to believe that we have some flexibility like that in chimps as well. Um, okay, but when looking at these um, chimp gestures, one natural question is, do they succeed? How well are they doing this? Well, how do we know that they have accomplished their goals and how do we determine their goals? Um, researchers talk about apparently satisfactory outcomes. They can find certain cases where the chimps stop signaling when the desired goal has been reached. Um, now they are, the primatologists are, are clearly aware that this is uh, not completely um, satisfactory. Um, given, th th there are immense methodological problems here. Um, consider what happens if you as a human being give a ask someone, um, or, or let's start with commands. What happens if you give someone a command and they don't do what they're told? Well, um, after a while, or they don't do what they're told, or you realize that they, they won't be able to do what you're told, where you stop giving the command. Um, that would, from the primatologist's point of view, be an apparently satisfactory outcome because I have stopped giving the command, or if I keep asking someone questions and it's clear after a while that they can't uh, answer my question, I stop asking them the question. So this purely behavioral-based um, assessment of have uh, the gestures succeeded, this is a bit problematic. And, and they do know that, and they're trying to work around it in certain ways, but it's still actually pretty hard to find a, a completely nicely working way around this. Um, okay, so far, chimps and gestures. Um, do we find questions among chimps? Well, we do find certain precursors of um, So something starts like questions, at least. Something good old um, called pantoots. Um, 
And one interesting thing is that it's special for these pantoots that they have a rising pitch, just as questions do in, um, in virtually all human languages, I think. Um, but it, it's not, they don't really function like um, questions do among us because they, they can't really be used to convey extra information. They're more like um, statements. They seem to be um, say they seem to be stating that something is a bit surprising. It's it's more tied to surprise. But this is kind of precursor also to the kind of curiosity request for information that we do find in humans. Um, <clears throat> They can, other primates, they, they can extract some information from adult members of the group who do not donate the information. There are some examples of this, but there's not much, and it's not as solidly um, studied as with the command gestures in primates. So there are some kind of examples. And we have in gorillas as well, the question mark. Um, curiosity or mild alarm. Something surprising is going on. We can find in other primates, um, baboons, where asking questions simply wouldn't really work. Um, because at least for male baboons, um, asking a question it would be a dangerous sign of weakness. Because uh, male baboons, they live in a cutthroat world in constant competition with other male baboons. Um, they uh, all, always nearly fight to the death to, to sort of keep their ranking in the hierarchy. And admitting that there is something you don't know would be ruthlessly exploited by um, other male baboons. So it would be... Um, very bad idea, actually, for a male baboon to ask a question. So I think that in that kind of social setting, the, the whole um, speech act activity of asking questions couldn't really get a hold because um, the, babo the baboon who asked the first question would be uh, quickly um, relegated to a low status in a pretty efficient way. Um, here we can cue uh, the ordinary the customary jokes about men never asking for directions when they're lost this is kind of uh, a remnant from baboon um, relatives who knows okay but humans do ask questions part of the explanation is that we have the right kind of social environment it's not at all like what we find in baboons not all our contacts are potentially antagonistic we have common projects, we have common intentionality, we have ways of um, going forward together in a way that is uh, not the case for the other primates, really. Because asking questions, it would be pointless if you were worse off as a result. Um, Andre, how am I doing on time? Good. You're doing terrific. Um, I'm assuming you're getting close to the final stretch. Yeah, OK. Um, OK, fin final then about questioning behavior and curiosity, how, how this uh, works. We talk about curiosity killing the cat. And of course, other animals um, can be and regularly are uh, curious. So just simple curiosity is not it's probably a necessary um, requirement for asking questions, but it's not the, it's not exactly the same as asking questions. Um, how sophisticated would our cognitive machinery have to be for um, asking questions to kick in? One, um, <clears throat> one very natural way of thinking of this uh, is Again, as I sort of hinted when, when I had put uh, Grice up on the, on the slide, uh, saying that the Gricean model was over-intellectualizing stuff, one way of understanding curiosity is also over-intellectualizing this. Um, we often find 
explanations of states of curiosity as a kind of metacognitive desire for knowledge or true belief. Say, which, which would require pretty sophisticated um, intellectual machinery to understand that now there's something missing in my equipment and I have to go out and fill that particular gap. And Carruthers thinks then in this paper from 2018, um, verbal questioning and states of curiosity are better explained by pre-linguistic sui generis types of mental attitude of questioning. So there is something um, specifically um, outwards directed, um, a mental attitude, which is not to be based on uh, metacognitive abilities. It comes from a more basic level. That's why he talks about it as the basic questions. So then th this just takes us to the catch-22 issue. Um, we need a language to ask questions. We need questions to learn the language. So perhaps we can bootstrap our way out of this. Um, let's hope we can, because obviously we all around in this setting actually do command the language. And so the problem must obviously have been solved in one way or another. Um, I'll skip these. Okay. Um, Children, the ultimate question askers. Um, and one of the interesting things here is that it comes very, very early. It's a pre-linguistic activity in children. Um, they don't, no one tells the child to start asking questions. They just do it. And they pepper us with lots and lots of questions. And at least when they're four years old, they're very tenacious. They keep asking questions until they're satisfied. And when are they satisfied? Normally, when uh, they get some kind of causal or causal sounding explanation. It doesn't have, of course, it doesn't have to be correct. We have superstitions all around the world and we have uh, myth of, uh, myths explaining why we have thunder or whatever. Um, the gods are angry, that's why we don't get any rain and so on. But they, these are causal explanations. And one interesting thing that has been noted by developmental psychologists is precisely that um, we, we find something very specific in pre-verbal human infants, something they call an information requesting mechanism. It's, it's something above and beyond the kind of curiosity we find in cats and rats and dogs and so on. It's because other animals, their curiosity is used to explore the world. And it's, of course, necessary for them to be able to do that. But pre-verbal infants, they explore what other, the, the grown-ups know about the world. And that's the information requesting mechanism. Um, already in pre-verbal children who are not yet asking linguistic questions, they can recruit information via gestures, expressions, and vocalizations. Anyone who has uh, taken care of small children would recognize this, but it has been, it's showing now 2007 is a nice and long study about these things. Um, so this is a kind of missing thing. We don't find this in chimps, but we do find it in humans. And it comes very, very natural for us. And uh, basically the explanation must be tied to our pro-social uh, nature. I don't know what comes first, um, but uh, the pro-sociality would have to um, factor into this. Since, as I argued at least, baboons can't really do any asking of questions at all, because that would be a dangerous activity for the baboons. But it's a it's a useful and good activity for small children because someone is taking care of them. Um, so um, I'm now winding down and I, I'll actually stop. Uh, there are a few more slides, but I will just say something about this. We 
as humans, I mean, perhaps you remember Dennett's uh, talk about the Darwinian, Skinnerian, Popperian, and Gregorian um, creatures that are um, around in the world. And they have different um, cognitive abilities, cognitive machinery. I'd like to add actually a fifth class, and that is the Collingwoodian uh, thing, because I don't think that then its highest level is the Gregorian creature, which can use certain kinds of uh, intellectual tools and spread these tools and so on. I think we should add as a fifth the Collingwoodian creatures, because Collingwood um, had a pretty strong view about this, that um, every statement anybody ever made is made in answer to a question. We are the question um, posing um, species. And there are not too many good examples of something like question answering, asking in um, other species. And I actually do have, um, that's it. I actually do have one prominent primatologist on my side then. Uh, though I think Goodall is only half right here. When she says what makes us human, I think is an ability to ask questions. That's right, I think. Um, a consequence of our sophisticated spoken language, that's wrong, I think. I don't think it is a consequence of it. I think it's uh, a necessary requirement for us having a sophisticated spoken language. Um, okay, that would be it then. And um, thank you. Um, um, Please join me in thanking Professor <laughs> Great, thank you so much for that. And now we move on to Q&A. Um, if there are some questions uh, online, please uh, don't hesitate to use the uh, raise virtual hand button. And if there are some questions here in the room, uh, we'll just uh, uh, take you as, as you go. We have a first question from Christina, please go ahead. Hi, very interesting talk. I was research on sign language because in the beginning when they teach sign language, do you hear me? Yeah, you, you, no, yeah. I hear you. It's well, do you hear me? Yeah. Yes. So there is a research on sign language. I guess that in the sign language literature, there should be something about asking questions, because that seemed to be a good place to start. Because to ask questions require answer, and because um, non human primates have very few gestures, then it's very hard to answer a question. So I was wondering what you think about um, sign languages in non human primates. Yeah, that's, that's a good. I don't I don't know enough about sign language. I just know some of the old stuff about um, um, children growing up signing quickly becoming better than their parents and and actually developing uh, a grammatically more sophisticated or complex um, sign language than their parents taught them and so on. So I, I don't know enough about the area, but it, yes, it would be. Um, definitely relevant so thank you um i will uh, try digging into that yeah great thanks so much um uh, we have a next question from uh lanny watson and then one from mitch lanny please go ahead hi thanks uh, so much uh frederick and um yeah i just uh had a question I'm really interested in your thoughts on the difference between requests and questions. Is the idea that um, questions are typically for information or is there another way of understanding the relationship between requests and questions? Um. The, there seems to be some kind of 
not quite a continuum here, but I, I've spoken to primatologists about this and, and they kind of started thinking about, okay, most of the things they find in um, looking at other primates would be commands, so kind of hard orders. But then there's something that they we perhaps should call soft commands, which uh, sort of start sliding into question. Could you perhaps uh, close the door? Is uh, grammatically a question, but speech act wise, it's more of a command. So we can see um, we can see a sort of sliding ourselves into full questions here. But what is, I think, a bit special is um, that for these pre-verbal human infants, uh, they are um, specifically looking for information from uh, their caregivers, something that we seem not really to find much of in other children. Because there is, for instance, there is some, not much, but there is some teaching of how to do things among chips. Um, how to get termites with a stick and so on. They, they look and they learn from others. Uh, so there is some cultural stuff going on here. It would be super useful for the young chimp uh, to be able to ask, could you please show me that again? I missed how you did with the stick or something like that. We don't really seem to find that. Um, so we don't, there, there is some extra step that, that is not quite there. Uh, but it is, we, we'll find occasions to talk about this uh, further in the future then, but um, there, there is some sorting out to, to be done among hard commands, soft commands, kind of requests for something in the world and then uh, kind of requests for information, you know, pure questions. Yeah. Brilliant, brilliant. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much to both. And Mitch, yep. Yeah. Thanks so much. Thanks, thanks so much for your talk. I found that really stimulating. And I just had a couple of questions for you about what you said. First, just kind of an offhand remark about Collingwood's, Collingwood's claim. It seems to be a pretty vast overgeneralization. I don't think he made that on the basis of any empirical evidence. I think it's one thing to say that, generally speaking, it's good to understand a person's assertion or statement in light of a potential question that it might be answering. It doesn't follow, I think, that every, every statement that's ever made <laughs> is itself an answer to a question that strikes me as a bit strong. But more interestingly, for me at least, I guess I'd want to ask, in traditional speech act theory, we often think of questions as pairing with answers, question answer pairs are the standard sort of category that people work with. And one thing that I found about your discussion is that there wasn't, I didn't, it didn't seem like you were paying much attention to the way in which questions and the potential answers relate to one another. And I was just kind of wondering whether you could maybe extemporize about that a little bit for the reason that if we have, and I don't know if you'll be able to come, but later this morning when I give my talk, I'll talk a lot, of, I'll talk about precursors of assertion, evolutionary precursors of assertion. Um, and I'm wondering whether we can form a picture on which there could be precursors of questions that are, that pair with those precursors of assertion. So something I'll call an er assertion or just er assertion might be something that could be a response to a proto question or something of the sort. What would a proto question be? Well, we can think about the grammaticalization of the interrogative mood with verb initial types of, uh, types of structures for sentences. We could also think about rising intonation contour as you, as, you, as you put it. And I think another thing that's worth keeping in mind might be that we sometimes make things that are sort of in the nether region between assertions and questions by putting, saying, using an indicative type sentence in a sort of tentative way. We might have rising intonation counter at the end, but maybe, maybe we don't need to. So I'm wondering whether if we already have a picture of a communicative practice on which assertions or maybe something like proto-assertions are in place, that would be a natural framework in which we could see things like proto-interrogatives arising whether or not they're syntactically marked. 
And it may be in the first instance, you've got something that's not syntactically marked, but we just put something for it tentatively while also manifesting our desire to, that other people give us more information to help, to, to help confirm that thing we're putting forth as potentially true. And then later on, a way of explicitly, or at least more explicitly indicating that we are putting forth something as an implicit request, because questions often are thought of as implicit requests for information, for mm -hmm. further confirmation, for example. So the thought is, I wonder if we could get a better handle on how questions could evolve by thinking about how they could do so in tandem with the evolution of things that are that are precursors of assertions and that end up being assertions proper in the later, you know, cultural evolutionary history or something of the sort. Yeah, good. Um, first, the, the Collingwood point, yes, you're, you're quite right. Um, he is over egging his source a bit there. Um, I just wanted a nice passage to sort of give, give the strong sense of it. Um, but but um, yes, we, I mean, if we look at the primatologist's uh, attempts to understand uh, apparently satisfactory outcomes, that, that was a way of trying to pair gesture with uh, um, response to, to the command. Mm -hmm. uh, and there were methodological issues there, and there will be uh, vast uh, methodological problems in, in trying to find the nice coupling between proto-questions and proto-responses as well. So but these are all... In, in the workaday methodological issues, one, once we get the right kind of structure, we we can see what's going on. Um, and I think you're absolutely right that we should see the um, understanding of the evolution of assertion uh, from some kind of proto-assertion should actually be uh, tied very tightly with the uh, evolution of questions. These two things probably must have uh, gone forward together. And uh, the fact um, we often find discussions in the evolution of language of, about how did assertions evolve or what shall we think of as assertions. And that just might be a kind of um, wearing blinkers of a kind, not looking at the essential role played by questions. So I think we we will have to, in order to get a correct picture of what's going on or what was going on once, um, we would have to to sort of understand how these things go, uh, come as a package. Good. Thank you so much. Yes. Please be sure to send your slides. I'm eager to uh, to look them over. <laughs> thanks. Great, thanks all. And uh, another quick question uh, from me, if I may. Um, uh, Wonderful talk. Um, I was wondering if there's um, anything in the way of a clear um, evolutionary uh, sort of uh, set of in-betweens, set of intermediary steps uh, between. The, you mentioned the, uh, what was it? The asking bark, I believe, and then right, the, the rising intonation. So what are the pre-verbal markers for questioning such that we might differentiate uh, their incre increasing complexity or something of the sort. And if you think that such a scale could be devised, or if you think that these are just haphazard developments that are hijacked by some kind of questioning attitude or something of the sort. My very offhand guess would be that it's hijacked. Um, but but that, is, that is purely a guess. Um, you, you can take a look at pre-verbal infants questioning stuff they they can do somewhat i i have raised three children and, and a couple of grandchildren so i have pretty much contact with uh, small children and they can be very different in their information requesting mechanisms i remember my daughter she she was the most explicit one she, she would actually grab my face and make me look at her in order to sort of give the right kind of information and that was a bit unusual, but it was clearly done in, in a certain setting of information requesting. And um, that, that's why I think my offhand guess would be that uh, it's hijacked from various quite different things going on. Um, but it would it is worth thinking about, and um, I wish I had a clearer, uh, not so offhand response to it.
Great, thanks for that. And if there are uh, some more questions, comments, rejoinders, either uh, in the room or online. And if not, please join me in thanking Frederick. Thank you, everyone.